<laughs> Y'all got quiet. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys this morning. I like to hear that little bit of bustle. That's good for us to have conversation, to check in on one another. Um, that That's good. Like whenever you have that, there's life in a church. And by golly, I'd rather prefer life in a church and silence you five minutes into the surface than to not have that. So thank goodness. Um, welcome this morning. We've got a few birthdays today. Somebody turned 70 today. That's not, that's not, you didn't turn 70 today, Tim. But you do also have a birthday today. <laughs> So happy birthday to those. If there's others that, uh, that we're missing today, I think my brother-in-law, if I'm correct, has his birthday today as well. So it's a good day. Clearly, it's a good day uh, to be born. But uh, guys, I have a lot of announcements for you this morning. Um, not a lot of them have to do with the sake of events and different things at the church, but I will make one announcement on that. Um, I want you guys to be aware that this coming Saturday uh, is the Bell uh, Town Christmas Parade. And so what we're planning to do to be a part of that celebration is we're going to meet here at the church around 3. Uh, we're going to decorate a float for that. We're going to have dinner together, make Christmas cookies. And then we're also, after going to the parade, we're going to carol up Witcher uh, with that same float. We're doing two birds, one stone is our, is our plan for this, okay? So I want to encourage you guys uh, this Saturday to come join us for that. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we're looking forward to having that as a witness in our town, but then also as an opportunity for us to share a little bit of Christmas cheer uh, of, the, of the creek. So I encourage you guys, if you can come for that, please do so. Um, uh, just a reminder, I know that some of you guys in the transition of um, in-person and, and um, online and being back in service and all those different things, and we've also moved boxes around. I just want to remind you guys that we have not passed a plate in well over a year and a half. Uh, I didn't hear hallelujah. I almost inserted one myself, but that's okay. Uh, we, do, we do have offering places so you guys can give to that. There's one in the back. It's to the right, and then we also have one to uh, the side. So if you guys have any questions about that, that's how we're doing that now. If you haven't seen a plate or if you've missed that, um, that's okay. If you're a guest with us, we are not necessarily expecting you to give because we just want you to enjoy being with us. Uh, we expect our regulars, however, to participate and support the ministry of the church. So thank you guys for that. Um, also, I've got some presents up here. Now, I'm sorry, birthday boys, the, the, the presents are not <laughs> for you. But uh, I want to have the youngest uh, in the family of kids to come up. We've got a little Advent devotional book for all of the kids. They can be enjoying that while they're in services um, throughout the month of Christmas. So uh, if I have the youngest representative of the kid in the family, and by kids, I mean like under 18, okay? That's true. Welcome. Okay, if we miss anybody, we're going to try to get those out to some that we're not able to make it um, this morning. Okay, another announcement that I have for you is one that um, is special. It is so exciting and also sad at the same time. You'll understand what I mean uh, in just a moment. So uh, I'm going to ask if Kyle and Megan Dangerfield will stand and then come up here and join me on the stage. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know if that was for Megan or for Kyle's beard. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, for, for many of you guys that have had the chance to get to know um, Megan and Kyle, uh, they have been a blessing to our church. Um, it has been some time since they have been coming and become uh, a part of our, our regular services, but um, I had the privilege during one of our, our small group meetings early on um, to pray with them to receive Christ, which is like the most important thing that a person can ever receive. And it's a privilege that I was able to do that um, with you guys. And I remember at that point, we were talking about different things and they did not feel like they could seek membership to the church at that point um, because of, of their living situation at the time. And I saluted them in that. They wanted to make sure that they waited until that they were married. They felt that that would be um, an honoring thing to the Lord before they could seek church membership anywhere. And I think that is a great testament um, to their relationship to the Lord and their honor for him. Now, the sad part of this is that uh, they have been moved by the Lord. They believe are, are led to take jobs in Virginia in the near future. I believe January is the plan uh, for those jobs to start. And so I talk with them with that. We're going to be desperately sad to see them go. But something I talk with them about is that since they have been married, since they followed through with that, the only thing that they thought 
um, hindered them from being able to be a member was that. And so what I told them I think would be a wonderful thing for us to do is for us to receive them as members of this church. This would be the first time they're officially recognized as members of a church. And so whenever they go and connect to a church, when they move, we are transferring a membership instead of them seeking to become members for the first time. Uh, this is so important for us. It teaches us something about the biblical principle that we don't just think of our small flock, but we think of the world that God has called us to reach. As much as we want people to become saved and become a part of our church and never leave, we want to hold on to them as long as possible. We know that the mission of God is to save people and God sometimes moves them and sends them to places that he wants them to be for specific work. And so we do not want to hinder or hold up something that God is doing. But I think it would be a great testament to us um, for recognizing um, their fruitfulness here, recognizing the work of God in them, for us to receive them as members. They have filled out cards officially to request membership of the church. And then sadly, in the not too distant future, we will likely receive a letter of transfer. But my friends, for people to have not been in the church, to be members of the church and then member someone else is the building of the kingdom of God. And we should be thankful and grateful for that. Um, so uh, how we do this here at Witchers, I just say, hey, would you guys like and receive for them to be official members of our church? Do you recognize them as such? And you guys would say? Amen. Amen. Okay. Look, you, I told you you'd make it. I told you guys would make it. In. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get you guys um, devotionals. And these aren't specifically a his or a her. You each need to read each of these. Okay. They are so good. Um, each of them is just a short de daily devotional because the most important thing you can do to grow in your relationship with God is to spend some time in the word daily. These are excellent. They will be great guides to you as you continue to learn to grow. And there's little notes in them as well. I'm not sure where to see them. <laughs> guys, I love you. Thank you. Oh, so good. So good to have you guys as a part of it. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't see anything wrong with prayer. <laughs> so uh, anyone that would want to pray, I know with, um, with COVID restrictions and distancing, people just want to like raise a hand where you're seating. That's okay too. But yeah, guys, come on up and anyone that wants to um, can pray over them. Or if you'd rather um, pray where you're at, that would be okay as well. These are the first people I ever got, saw got saved when I studied the church constitution. <laughs> 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 God, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for um, your word that came to them, for them to see their need for you, uh, to bring a conviction of sin, and Father, for them to desperately want you and to seek that out. God, thank you for that. God, thank you for the fruitfulness we've seen in their lives, uh, participating in. Uh, giving, whether that's to the food pantry or to the box, whether that's faithfulness and attendance, involvement, uh, bringing candy or to games. Father, th there's fruits that your spirit is within them. And God, we thank you for that. God, this, is, this might be a sad time for us to see them go, but Father, may we rejoice in them being sent to continue your work where you're calling them to go. Bring them the church you want for them. They may get plugged in and continue to grow and have years of faithful service to you until we get to see them again, whether in visit or whether we get to see them again for forever. God, we thank you and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <laughs> Um, I hope you guys this morning, whether you're our regular or a visitor, are able to see that um, for the blessing that it is. If not, it might be because you lost a pair of glasses. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Do you like that transition? Okay. This, this has been lost. This is a pair of glasses that we have found here at the building. We tried to ask a few folks this morning we thought it might belong to, and no one has claimed it yet. If you can think of someone, hey, that kind of looks like their glasses, and maybe we've missed them or we haven't seen them, please... Uh, please talk to that person. We're going to continue to hold on to these. 
Uh, so please make sure that you think about this. Is this your glasses? And if it is not, if you can't see to tell, it could be yours, okay? <laughs> just just come up and, and, and try those on. Um, I think that's the announcements that I have for you guys um, this morning. I do want to remind the ladies, the WMU ladies, that tomorrow um, is the, the gift exchange, the ladies a meeting for December. Gift exchange, you can bring a food item to share. Uh, that's the first time they've done that since COVID season. So I know that's a little bit of a celebration to be able to do that. So ladies, don't forget that's tomorrow at 1. Did I get that, Miss Wanda? Yes. Good, good. Okay. Um, I think that's announcements that I have. I'd like to turn our service to a time of prayer request. Um, who are those that we can lift up this morning in Hi. prayer? Miss Pat? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll pray for those safe travels. Continue to remember Daniel and his family. Others this morning. Yes, Miss Wanda. Okay. Uh, Mark surgery is scheduled for the fifteenth. Remember Mark Hart. Belita, do I see your hand? Continue member Jody Green, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Bud McAllister, him and his wife Donna used to be members here years ago, but uh, Bud is sick and Donna okay. called and asked that we remember them. Okay, um, Bud Mc McAllister. Bud okay. McAllister. Judy and her brother Jack. Judy and her brother Jack, thank you, Linda. My niece Alexis uh, Cox, they're inducing her today. So okay. Yeah, that all goes well for baby and mom. Okay. Jim, do I see your hand? Yes, uh, Miss Sharon and my mother uh, continue to remember my grandkid and Gary Mullins. Uh, okay. Gary has oh, lymphoma cancer. There we go. I don't know why I can't remember that. But yes, and he starts his treatment this week. Very <coughs> super aggressive, he said. The cancer is and the for the cancer is. So, please remember Gary and Peggy Mullins. Okay. Others this morning? Rick Stickley. Others this morning? Yes, Miss Mary? We'll pray for that test, Miss Mary. Any others this morning? Unspoken requests? Yep. Guys, let's pray. Guys, we gather here today. Um, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for another day of life. God, we thank you for the excitement um, around new believers that are continuing to walk with you and are going to be walking into the unknown future. God, be with them on that journey. I get them plugged in where they need to be. God, I pray that you'd be with the multiple requests that have been mentioned this morning. Uh, many of them might be the loss of a family member. God, we pray that you continue to be with them and to strengthen them. God, many of these are people that are struggling with COVID or physical ailment of cancer treatments coming up or the possibility of results coming back that uh, may not be what we would like. God, I pray that you'd be with each and every one. God, I pray for healing in a way that's just miraculous. I pray for a way that baffles the minds of doctors that they cannot think of any other reason other than God doing something miraculous. God, we pray and we ask for that. God, when you answer in a different way, then we trust that you still have a good plan. God, be with all of the unspoken requests this morning, uh, those that are heavy on people's hearts, that you would heal, that you would mend, that you would come close, Father, in those. Um, in our service, we just pray that you um, would have your way, that we might hear clearly from you. We might be encouraged by the truth of your word. And Father, we might be changed by what you've done for us. Uh, we thank you. We ask these things today in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.
morning, church. As we head into this um, Christmas season, I'm going to ask you to stand and sing with me this morning, The First Noel. As little children, we would dream of Christmas morn And all the gifts and toys we knew we'd find But we never realized a baby born one blessed night Gave us the greatest gift that he gave his life we are the reason that he suffered and died to a world that was lost he gave all he could give to show us the reason to
us is our reason to today, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, tells us, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the time when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head even christ so i'm going to ask you if you'll sing with me this morning i will sing of my redeemer <laughs> Our second candle that we light this morning is the candle of preparation, and I hope you're prepared for the second coming of Christ, as they prepared for the first coming back when he was born. Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 says, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. morning again church um, we've already had a lot uh, that we've experienced in our service so far um, exciting things um, things to think about um, the minor technical difficulty um, all of those things a part of a normal day experience I hope that as you've if you've already been blessed by the service so far and I hope that you have 
that you continue to be, that as we're going to open from God's word, we're going to hear things that are so important for us, uh, especially in this Christmas season. Uh, if you were not able to join us last Sunday evening, this perhaps looks a little bit different, right? The space looks a little bit different. Uh, our Christmas stuff is clearly up. We walk in, you're like, okay, it's Christmas, right? We've got the poinsettias, we've got the tree, we've got the colors, we've got greenery and those kinds of things. Um, but it's easy for us to think of some of the trappings that make Christmas Christmas and miss Christmas. And so I hope that we um, don't do that this morning. If you would, please turn with me uh, in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we'll start in verse 1 in just a moment. Uh, now, if you don't have a Bible here this morning, that's okay. Just listen, follow along. There'll be some of this um, on the screen behind me um, eventually. Uh, if you know someone that would like to see that and you have one, just share your Bible with a neighbor. Feel free to do that um, this morning. But we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 3 in just um, a moment. What I'm hoping to address this morning um, is our Christmas need our Christmas need. Now, this word Christmas has been attached to so many different things. Um, Christmas is a huge marketing uh, day for uh, for all the companies. In fact, if you have not seen commercials lately, uh, man, they have they have really stepped up their game. They they're doing really well. I succumb to one of the Christmas ads this week. Okay, on Friday night, I had a busy week. I didn't feel like making dinner. I told my wife I didn't feel like she had to make dinner, and so we were going to make use of one of the Pizza Hut Christmas ads. For dinner on Friday, okay? They have like a three pizza box deal, uh, and it, it's awesome. I'm telling you, you get a one topping pizza, a specialty pizza, you got breadsticks, and their little cinnamon delights. It's delightful, okay? If you if you are needing if you need an option for dinner sometime in the Christmas season, I do recommend it. But it came in this box. I picked it up, and it's in this box. Like they're not individually wrapped; they're all in one box, like as if it's a present right? And it says naughty or nice, everyone gets a slice. And I was like, that is brilliant marketing. That is just, that's, that's brilliant. That, that is marketing at its best. Uh, but this season, we come to this season and we are bombarded by ads and commercials and different things, movies, different things that are telling us what we need in order to have a good Christmas. I mean, we are bombarded with stuff. According to the commercials, I need a lot of different things, okay? I need to have individual jammies for every single member of my family. It's a need that I have to have, according to commercials. Um, I have to have stocking gifts, okay? Well, that means I have to have stockings, then I have to have little things that are then wrapped and then put into those stockings. And that's not enough. I can't just have gifts that are in stockings. I have to have gifts that go under the tree. You can't have stocking gifts and have an empty tree, right? According to commercials and according to movies. And if you're going to have gifts underneath the tree, that means you can't like sparse gifts under the tree. You know, you're supposed to have gifts underneath the tree, decent gifts. And then uh, whenever you move away, even just from the gift stuff, which means that there's got to be shopping, you got to be thinking about what does this person need? What are their sizes? of clothes what are those different things but in addition to those christmas things that we see in pictures there's christmas foods right i mean you've got to have sugar cookies and you've got to have certain things or there's stuff that gets made every single christmas holiday you got to go out and make sure that you've got that stuff and we're in COVID season so we got to get it early to make sure that if the shipment doesn't make it in we get it okay right this is part of the christmas need of the season Christmas clothes to wear. I mean, you can't just wear jammies to church. If you do, we still love you. Come, okay? But, you know, when, according to the commercial, according to the, you need to make sure that you've got these beautiful sweaters or these beautiful scarves or these beautiful dresses or whatever it is as something you need. If you watch a Christmas Hallmark movie, my goodness, these people are models in clothes that are hundreds of thousands of dollars by the end of the movie, okay? It's crazy what is brought to us as a Christmas need. Well, you have to have Christmas clothes to wear to Christmas activities, right? I mean, uh, we have to have Christmas activities where in addition to the gifts we've got for our homes, we need gifts for multiple people, or uh, we need to have Christmas cards that are sent to people. And so there's all of these Christmas things that we're supposed to have in order to have Christmas. And I failed to mention Christmas decorations. I haven't even mentioned that yet, right? We have to have inside decorations. We need to have outside decorations. If you only do inside decorations, you don't care about people outside your house, right? And so, you, I mean, and, and how much, where's the limit for decorations? Does every room in the house have to have something? Do I have to have a Christmas candle and not a regular candle in my bathroom now? Do I have to have a Christmas hand tail in my bathroom now? Okay. Is, is the hand soap have to be Christmas now? It can't be regular hand soap. It must be Christmas hand soap. We laugh because this is true, right? 
Uh, I failed to mention Christmas entertainment, okay? Christmas music. We have to defrost Michael Buble and whoever your favorite people are when it comes to Christmas. Christmas movies. Have we watched The Grinch? Have we watched A Christmas Carol? Charlie Brown Christmas? Rudolph? The Christmas Story? Polar Express? Christmas Vacation? And more that I haven't mentioned that are staples for you. What about events? What about going to live stuff like the Nutcracker or Christmas cantatas or live nativities or Christmas lights? My goodness, guys, all of these things are pictured to us or sold to us or told to us. We have to have these things or we haven't had Christmas. Some combination of everything mentioned so far is needed in order for us to have said that we have had Christmas and to experience the joy of this season. Allow me to lighten your load a bit this morning and try to convince you from the scriptures that we have really only one need this Christmas. Only one need. And I think that we find that um, in Genesis chapter, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 24. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say that you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was delightful to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. From out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Uh, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of the living. And the Lord God made, Adam, uh, or made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has now become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. And live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Uh, I know that's a lengthy passage this morning. Uh, It makes several references to tree that is not Christmas tree. Okay, if you hear that and you're not familiar, it's not a Christmas tree. Uh, It's talking about a very distinct uh, moment in our history. So uh, today I want to focus on a couple of things. I want to focus on our history, a good part and a bad part. I want to focus on our loss. I want to focus on our need, right? Our Christmas need. And then briefly, I want to talk about our hope. Uh, I think we can find all of these in this passage. 
So briefly, our history. Uh, whenever we open this book that's called the Bible, we open the first book of the Bible called Genesis, especially chapters 1 and 2, it um, tells us, it explains to us, it tells us, argues to us that this is a recording of the history of mankind on earth. This is our origin story, according to this book, which also claims to have the authority of God. It was written and inspired by God. This is our maker's instruction to us. This is our history. Uh, if you ever go to some place and see like a, a great little documentary on the history of our nation or the history of the birth of this movement or the history of this, this is what Genesis 1 and 2 is telling to us. This is our story. If we want to know something about ourselves, we need to learn what chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis say about us. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 briefly, since I didn't read those and I don't have time for that this morning. They tell us of creation of the world, of the trees that we see when we walk out of this place, of everything that we see around us, the hills, the wonderful uh, scenery God's given us here in West Virginia, Best Virginia. Best Virginia, throwing that out there. For any that may be in place or, or in this place or also online, uh, Best Virginia. All of creation that we see, if we ever go somewhere else, another state, another country, anything we see, if we fly in an airplane and see the clouds and the sun and sunsets and we see land from far down below, anything we see in all of creation, God is responsible for. He also made us. We are part of the living beings that God made for this world. He made males and females both in his image. There is something that mankind has bestowed upon us, a glory and a privilege that nothing else in all of creation has been given. There's a likeness that we have to God that God designed for us to have an ability for us to reflect his goodness into this world he has placed us in. And he placed us into a good world. He made a garden, it tells us. Uh, and he proceeded that all of the things in the garden would meet our needs. Everything we needed for survival, for thriving, was present. We had access to God. It tells us that he walked with us, right? We're told later in this passage that God comes to walk with Adam and Eve and they distance themselves. But what that tells us is that at one time, God walked among us as if we had this close relationship to the source of life. He also provided in this garden something called the tree of life or the source of life. We had access to this tree as if we could just pick an apple or pick a cherry off of some tree that we have today. But there was also another tree that was in there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God forbade us to eat from that. And that's still a part of our good story because what we were to learn from this is that if God has given us everything for our good and if God says one thing is not good for us, we need to learn from God that we can trust him in that. Even if there's a, a boundary or a perimeter that is placed, that is for our good. It is for our protection. So this is our good story. We are created uh, by God. We are created in his image. He gave us everything to sustain life with us. There was nothing good that he withheld from us. Here's also a part of our history. This is the not so good part. Okay, this is not so good part of our story, uh, because maybe you heard that you're like, okay, God created us all good and everything was great. Well, that is not what I experience every day. Okay, that's not what I experience, right? Why is there sickness? Why is there COVID? Why is there death? Why is there loss? Why do bad things happen to good people? Those are excellent questions. Excellent questions. Well, there's a part of our history that we need to understand, not just the good part of it, but the not so good part of it. There's an enemy, a deceiver, as he is described throughout the scriptures, that came to tempt the first man and the first woman to be disobedient to God, to be disobedient, to not trust everything that had been given to them, to not trust all the good plans that God had purpose. He came intentionally, it tells us in the scriptures, to rob and to steal and to destroy. And he accomplished exactly what he sought after doing. Uh, in verse 1, the second half of that, what we're going to see is that he first questioned what God said. Did God actually say, he said to the woman? Did, did God really say that? Did, did God really say that if, if you, you're not allowed to eat from that one tree? He questioned what God said. He went beyond that in verse 4 to minimize the penalty for disobedience. We know that by her response, she knows well that there is something forbidden. 
She not only knows, well, there's something forbidden, she knows there's a penalty or a consequence if they were to eat what is forbidden. And so whenever she explains that to him, he's like, well, you're not going to surely die. It's more of a, well, you know what? It, if you do disobey God, it's really not going to have the negative consequence you think it's going to do. It's really not going to be so bad. The whole world isn't going to fall apart or anything, is what he would have said. So he minimizes a penalty for disobedience. Listen, if you have life and death before you, and those are your only options, and disobedience equals death every time, how can you minimize the penalty of disobedience? In verse 5, he questioned the goodness of God. He went beyond just questioning what God had said. Notice what is said in verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Essentially, the deceiver, the enemy said, listen, God only gave you that command to hold you back. God put a limit on you. So that's something that only he could enjoy. God's limiting your potential. God says that he created this good world. God says that everything is good. God said that everything that you need is here. You don't need anything else. In fact, if you never eat from that tree, you have everything you ever need. I'm telling you differently. I'm questioning the goodness of God. Would a good God put any limits on anyone? Would be the deception that takes place here. Isn't freedom mean anything I want to do? Isn't that exactly the best for me? So what we see is that these seeds of, of doubt have been placed. Not only in Eve, it tells us that um, Adam is there. He's silent. He's not doing anything. But he is hearing this right along with Eve, offering no protection, no kickback. No, but I know God said that. No, but I know that disobedience is going to be bad for us. None of that. Okay. And so Satan placed a desire in the hearts of Adam and Eve for something outside of God. This is, there's something God's holding back from you. You can have something outside of what God wants for you and it'll be better for you than what God has said is good and right for you. That they had a desire for something outside of God. They desired to tell God, you can't tell me what to do. God, you may have made me. Okay, that's cool. Thanks for that. But I think I can do just fine by myself from here. And they fell for it. Whew, they, they fell hard. Um, it's easy for us to be like, man, <laughs> you let us down. <laughs> right? If, if I was just there, guys, we've all been there and we have all done the same thing. We have all, every single one of us, thought we knew better than God how to do something. And so they took the bait and we have taken it too. Now here's the problem. That's our history. That's our history. That the good and the bad, that is our story. In fact, that's the best explanation for why there's evil in the world. Because every single person after that is now thinks that they know better than God. And if we are not meeting God's standard of good... The whole world is the result of what we think is good, and that's why it's so broken. That's incredibly why it's so broken. That's why people think it's okay for them to do whatever it is. That's why they think that there shouldn't be any ramifications for their decisions, no consequences. That's why people can murder someone and still give a defense for their actions. My friends, this is our story. This is what the scriptures clearly tell us. What have we lost because of this? Oh, my friends, this is, this is tremendous. What we have lost. Um, in verse 7, we have become aware of our failure. In verse 7, the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Now, I have never attempted to make clothing out of leaves, never attempted to do this. I imagine that the ability to do that didn't cover incredibly a lot, okay? I've never, never tried to do that. But it's amazing that this one thing that they all of a sudden realize that what they have done is to mess up. Immediately, they're trying to cover. Immediately, they're trying to hide what they've done wrong. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, summed it up brilliantly. He says, now, when it is too late... 
they saw the happiness from which they had fallen from and the misery they had fallen into. Love that. At this time, they just did not see how good they had things until they gave up the good things they had. Didn't see it. Didn't know it. In this moment, their eyes were open. The same to, uh, to see them. That must be so good. God was holding out on you. Their eyes were open. And in that moment, they realized, they, man, they, they caved. The, the, the ad got them. And it did not purchase for them what they thought they were getting. Not only did they, did they lose this goodness that God had placed around them, they're now aware of their own failure and they try to hide it. They're afraid of God now. They're afraid of the person that made them. They're afraid of the person that's the source of their life. They're afraid of the person that's provided everything that they've ever known up to this point in existence. They're afraid of them for good reason. In verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You go down to verse 10. And it tells us, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. There is a fear mentioned twice in this passage. John Wesley also said it brilliantly. He said, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, a sad change. Before they had sinned, if they heard the voice of the Lord God coming toward them, they would have run to meet him. But now God has become a terror to them. My friends, the loss of Adam and Eve in their view and perception of God is tremendous. They're now afraid of the, their source of life. They're afraid of a person who has only produced love and goodness for them. They're afraid of him. What was once a, a solid relationship, when you walk with someone, you agree to walk with someone because there's a closeness there. And now that person comes to walk with you and you're like, I don't, I don't think I can bring myself um, to, be in your, to be in your presence. They knew. They knew in that moment that they were guilty. They knew it. They knew it. And they did not know what that was going to mean. They didn't know what God was going to react with. But not only have they failed, they're aware of that. Not only are they afraid, they refuse to take personal responsibility and become hostile to their fellow man. Another loss is instead of that deep connection that Adam and Eve had with each other, now they refuse to take ownership for their fault, even though they know it's true. We see that they know their failure. We see that they know that they're afraid, but they, they're going to blame each other. They're not going to take responsibility for their own sin. Eve was guilty. Adam was guilty. But neither one of them was going to acknowledge and take personal responsibility for their sin. So they become hostile towards each other. Spurgeon, I think, put it best on this one. He said, Adam had been an unfallen creature just hours before. But now he had broken the commandment of the Lord. And you can see how completely death was brought into his mortal nature. For if it had not been so, he would have said, my God, I've sinned. Can and will you forgive me? But instead of doing so, he laid blame for his sin upon his wife, which was an utterly mean action. The woman who gave, that you gave to be with me, she gave me of this tree and I did eat. He almost seemed to lay the blame upon God because he had given him the woman to be with him. He was guilty of unkindness to his wife and guilty of blasphemy against his maker and seeking to escape from confessing the sin which he had committed. It is an ill sign, an ill sickness with men when they cannot be brought frankly to acknowledge their own wrongdoing. Guys, this loss is tremendous. Uh, we still experience this in the divisions we see today. It's because we cannot own up to our own failures. We have political parties that cannot acknowledge that they are both incredibly messed up. They cannot Acknowledge that they are both far from the standards and goodness of God. Guys, I wish our loss was just that. It's not our loss continues to grow like a snowball rolling down a hill. They will receive penalties for their disobedience. Just penalties for their disobedience. 
They're going to be uh, removed from God's presence. But before we get to that part, I want us to, to talk just a moment about um, these penalties. Okay, They are convicted. They are caught in the act. And they are going to be sentenced for what they have done. Verse 13, God asks it in this question. He gives them an opportunity to give a defense for themselves. They played this blame game. And he says it specifically to Eve on this one. What is this you have done? What is this that you have, have done in this one act of disobedience against God? What is now the result for the rest of the world? Again, I think it's Spurgeon here that gets it best. By their actions, the floodgates had been pulled up. The flood of sin had been let loose upon the world. They had struck a match and set the world on fire with their sin. Um, historically, I grew up in a place um, that they built a man-made dam and they flooded entire communities in order to do that. Uh, and that, that you can see images of that. If you were to go down and dive, you can go down below there and you can see houses and trees and things down there. According to Spurgeon, the one disobedient act of Adam and Eve is as if they let flood into the world that has consumed all the homes of all of civilization from the moment of their birth all the way to this present moment. Sin is now here. Disobedience to God is now here and it cannot be undone. A match has been struck and has been dropped and the forest is raging. We have a great loss of the innocence that once was a part of our existence. We have a great loss of this connection to God. There are penalties mentioned for the serpent. There's penalties mentioned for the woman and penalties mentioned for the man. I'm not going to focus on those individually. I'm going to focus on the greatest loss of all. Guys, we have experienced loss, failure, fear for God, blaming other people, receiving penalties for disobedience. That is not the greatest loss that we experienced. We find this in verse 23 and 24. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden. If we were to go on to verse 24, he drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. My friends, the greatest loss for all of humanity is that we have been removed from God's presence and from our very source of life. Everything that brought us existence, everything that brought us goodness, everything that allowed us to live, we distanced ourselves from. God could not allow sin in his presence. He's perfect. He could not. The only just and righteous thing for God to do was to remove the first man and the first woman from the perfect garden in which he had made. My friends, when we hear about this throughout the pages of the Old Testament, when they talk about sin... They don't talk about it as if the biggest problem of the fall is on the change of our human nature, although that has happened and we are all now born sinners. They don't talk about it as if the, the biggest change is that we now have a heart condition that needs to be changed. We need a new heart, although that is also mentioned. The biggest description throughout the Old Testament and into the New, the biggest loss is our access to the presence of God. The overwhelming loss was not paradise. Perhaps you've heard the phrase paradise lost. That was not the greatest loss. It wasn't the garden. It wasn't the goodness of the fruit. It was that God could no longer walk with us. It's the greatest loss humanity has suffered. It's the most lamentable result of this sin is that it doesn't just make people bad. It makes God distant from us. Our sin, our blatant dishonor for God has cut us off from his Presence. That's why the entire Old Testament is talking about God making a people and God making a place in which his presence can dwell. Because that was the most important need that the people saw was once again to be able to be in the presence of their maker. So whenever we talk about our loss and we are desperately lost, it brings us in this passage to our need. Well, what is our need? I could summarize it in three ways, but they're really all the same, okay? It's really the last one, but we can summarize it in three different ways. We need forgiveness of our sin. 
You see, man was not just, or Adam was not just the first man. He was the representative of all mankind. It's like we were to send somebody, a president from our United States to a NATO meeting. He represents the entire United States as one person. The decisions he makes there affects the entire country. Even if we don't have a say in them, his decision affects us all. Adam was such in the eyes of God. His act, his disobedience of him and Eve represented all of humanity. All of us stand before God and as guilty of a state as they do. So we need forgiveness of sin. We need forgiveness of what is broken. We need rescue from death. Guys, they, they, they were kicked out of the garden, kicked out of the person who breathed life within to them. They're kicked out of access of a tree that can give you life. Death is now inevitable for every single human being. We need rescue from death. And this is not just a physical death. This is we need rescue from our soul being dead outside of the presence of God. So our deepest need is access to God's presence. If we could just come back to the Father, if we, if we could just be in his presence again, we could ask for the forgiveness that we need. We could find rescue from death. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death has spread to all men, because all have sinned. So what I want you to know is our biggest Christmas need is not anything I mentioned whenever we started our message this morning. Our biggest Christmas need is to be restored into a right relationship with God. This is our biggest Christmas need. If we have everything else that's mentioned, it could be fun. It could be enjoyable. It might not even quite be sinful. I don't think it's sinful to enjoy Christmas movies or Christmas food or time together. But if we do those things and we never have our Christmas need met. We have missed it all. We have missed it entirely. Here's the thing. We have a great, great need. We have a need to be restored to God. And God plants the hope of a rescuer in these verses as well. In verse 15, he's dealing out these penalties for people, whether it was the serpent or the enemy, whether it was the woman or whether it was man. And what we see in verse 15 is something tucked away that uh, many scholars and church fathers believe to be the first hints of the hope of Jesus. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So between, uh, between the deceiver and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. So he's going to describe all humanity are going to fall into the categories of being under the influence of the evil one are going to be under the influence of one who is yet to come. He's going to have a person that descends from Eve that will one day come into the line of man. And he's going to bruise your head, okay? So, so the serpent's going to bruise his head, but, uh, or he's going to bru the, the, the Christ is going to bruise his head, meaning a definitive uh, blow. If you're to crush the head of a snake, it's a definitive blow to the snake. And you're going to, to bruise his head. Heal. Now, this is a deep prophecy. This is something that we don't, we don't speak in this way in many ways today, so it might be harder for us to understand. Many church fathers and many, um, many commentaries believe that this is a promise of one who will come, a man who will come who will be able to put us in right relationship with God again. The sin and the evil that continues to persuade us, that continues to tempt us, that continues to tell us we can do better outside of God— will one day be defeated. He'll be crushed. And we'll be able to receive, once again, the presence of God to make all things new within us. My friends, our story uh, started good, and then it, it went pr south pretty quickly. We have tremendous loss. We have tremendous need. But according to the Christmas story, there's a person who was born by the name of Jesus. There's a person who was born that when the announcement of his birth came by angels, it said that through him, we can find forgiveness of our sins. My friends, the reason why we celebrate Christmas is that God came to us to restore what we broke. Guys, you're not going to find a better, a better example of love than that. We messed up, we distanced, we put ourselves to the side, we brought the mess that we now experience, and God came to offer 
a solution. The arrival of Jesus in a manger is the fulfillment of the promise of our hope. Easter reminds us of the price he would ultimately pay so that we could be forgiven. But my friends, this Christmas, make sure you have your Christmas need met. Make sure you do not miss the person who has come for you to restore you, that we might have life and have it abundantly according to the words that would come out of that child's mouth. My friends, as we close, if you're a believer, if you're hearing all this and you're like, okay, pastor, I know that, I know that, I know that my sins separate me from God, I know I received them. Listen, you let that be the greatest truth and experience that shines this Christmas season. Bring yourself back to that. Make sure that's the thing that you're excited about the most. If you're here today and like, listen, I've never heard that. <laughs> I've never heard that before. I've never heard that explanation for why there's evil in the world. I've never heard that explanation of, of that I have a deep need that only God can meet and he sent someone to, to rescue me. Listen, I, I encourage you, um, either find someone around you or, or find me after this. Service. Let's talk about that because you have a Christmas need that no present will fill. No light will lighten up. You have a Christmas need that no amount of the experiences we talked about earlier is going to fill unless you receive the hope of the rescuer, which is Jesus. Let's close this morning in prayer. God, as our, as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, we thank you for these words to tell us of our condition to tell us of our history, of your goodness to us, of your perfect created world, of the life that you gave to us, of all of our needs provided for. And Father, also of the truth of how we made a, a big mess of things. Father, we were deceived into thinking that we can find life outside of you. God, we, we attempted it and it failed miserably. But God, I pray that each of us will hear that. We will understand the need of our hearts to be reconnected to you. And Father, this isn't just something that we need and it's never been provided. But Father, you loved us so much. You came to us in the birth of Jesus at Christmas. The promise that we could be reunited, that our sins could be forgiven, paid for. God, I pray for every person this morning that by the end of this day, if not the end of this season, that they'll have their Christmas need met. They'll ask for you to come into their lives, to change them, to restore them, to forgive them, to rescue them from death. And Father, they'll be ready to have whatever the future throws at them because their greatest need has been met. God, we pray and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. And amen. You stand and join me for our invitation hymn. <laughs> to you to be in this service this morning. Um, I hope that if you have not had your Christmas need met, it will weigh on you until you do. Uh, I'm going to ask someone to close us in prayer, and after that, I'm going to go back to the back if someone wants to meet or talk. I'm also going to ask Kyle and Megan to go back to the back, so people did not have the chance to shake hands or want to say something mm -hmm. to them, they can, they can do that. Um, Tim, would you please close our service in prayer? I'm Father, Lord, thank you for this. Enjoyed here this morning, Lord. We 
we ask that your blessings continue in this church and your members with that. Uh, and as Pastor Jonathan said, the Lord would be the greatest gift, Lord. Uh, it was a good, good sermon, a good presentation, Lord. Watch over and protect us and be with us in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.